Good morning. This is Chip from The Real Dirt, live from Oklahoma. Or, I'm live, and uh, you're probably live because you're listening to this, but this actually isn't a live recording. But uh, here I am, sunrise on the farm. Neighbors' chickens are chickening. The wind's blowing. And, uh, wow, man, we've really come to love Oklahoma. Really cool state. Lots of really cool people, really eager, eager to to learn and grow some great, great cannabis. And this weekend we had a Canacon. Um, for those of you who don't know what a Canacon is, that is a uh, national trade show. They might even be international by now, but they they hop around town to town um, in all the legal cannabis markets and have a trade show. It's usually business to business trade show. They've had a couple here in Oklahoma because Oklahoma is considered the hottest cannabis market in the country right now. Um, many of you know I'm in the uh, uh, picks and shovel side of the business here, uh, as as well as anything associated with cannabis, where whether it's hemp or ganja or cultivation or extraction, um, hydroponics, organics, I'm into it. And, you know, I got the opportunity to speak at this latest Canacon here in Oklahoma City. I chose to speak on a topic that uh, many of my my customers and many of the people that I've been talking to have, have brought up, which is organics and living soil. And I uh, had a great, great reception, great talk there at Canacon. Uh, to my surprise, it was standing room only. People truly want to hear about organics and living soil here in Oklahoma and, and, you know, more so than other legal markets, that's for sure. Um, so I, I decided though that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of problems with organics and I just wanted to bring those up. Um, and I, and I did in this talk and that, and that's what you're going to hear on this episode is my, my talk at the Canacon 2019 Oklahoma city. We talk about organics and, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't go into terrible depth. Um, it's really a surf, surf, surfacery conversation um, about organic inputs and the dangers of some organic inputs and, and where they come from. Uh, you know, I, I often can disturb people with my opinions, and I've been up on a soapbox preaching organics in the past and or preaching hydroponics in the past, whatever it happened to be. And, you know, I've, 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 I've literally grown, um, grown out of the soapbox. Uh, maybe I'll still get on it in the future, but, you know, I, I believe that there's a great, great importance of, of, uh, organic gardening and of, uh, really treating the soil and the earth, um, first. However, man, there's a lot of bad pots a lot of bad things associated with organic farming and organic gardening. Uh, you know, the source of the organic materials might not be so uh, friendly to the earth. There's, um, you know, the acquisitions of some of these materials, like our favorite bat guano or maybe one of the most used lime, uh, they're all pretty destructive to our planet. So that's that's the, the, the thing I wanted to come across in this talk and... You know, as I listened to the tapes of it, I realized that, you know, in the midst of the talk, I might not have quite come across everything right. So, so I just want to set it straight before you listen to it. Is I mean, I really love organics, and the best weed I've ever had has been outdoor, Northern California grown organic weed. Now, I know the Oregon people and the Colorado people and the Oklahoma people are going to be like, "No, the best is in Oklahoma, Oregon, Colorado, whatever." But the best I have had has been outdoor organic um, cannabis hey thanks guys for coming out we're gonna get go ahead and get started everybody else it looks like everybody's kind of here my name's Chip Baker and I love weed uh, I love all types of weed. It doesn't matter if it's uh, any type of cannabis, right? Hemp, Mexican brick import, uh, 
<laughs> seedy Colombian weed, great, great Northern California grown outdoor indoor weed, aeroponic, hydroponic, organic. I really do love it all and I'm fascinated by it all. And I've been doing this a long time and uh, I've been on a soapbox on many things about cannabis over the years. But uh, I, I really do love cannabis in all its forms. As I'm getting older, I'm 47 now, uh, I start to realize maybe some of the things I thought about when I was younger or uh, some of my other customers tell me about, they, they might not really be uh, as accurate as we want them to be. Uh, this picture here it looks like a, a modern greenhouse, uh, light deprivation. You can see it's a glass house. It's really a beautiful garden. Uh, this was about a 40,000 square foot indoor garden that I was a part of back in 2002. So uh, this was in Switzerland, um, uh, and uh, uh, the, the picture might not be that very good on this, but uh, if you could see it, you could see 40,000 square feet of organic cannabis grown in the ground. Um, that uh, really a, um, an incredible crop. And for a number of years, a buddy of mine, Scott Blakely, he had operations in Switzerland, and, and we worked over there for, for a while. So just a little bit about me. So uh, I've got some credit if you guys don't know who I am or, or what's been going on. Uh, I am the founder of Cultivate Garden Supply. We're a hydroponics store. But don't worry, I'm not here to sell you anything. I truly just want to talk about organics and the impact of it. Uh, I was also the founder of Royal Gold Potting Soil out of uh, Humboldt County. Um, started that in 2002. I sold that in 2013. Started another potting soil company, Grower Soil, in Denver. And uh, in, in 2016, I have literally processed thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of yards of cocoa fiber. I've made thousands and thousands of yards of compost, millions really. Uh, one of the, the most proud things that I have that I've done in my, my life, the thing that I'm most proud of is I have diverted thousands and thousands of yards of sawdust from the landfill that would be burned or pushed into the ocean or dumped off in the woods somewhere, and I turned that into compost. But I'm just a normal guy. <laughs> I love weed, like I said before. Uh, this is my lovely wife to the right, and uh, two guys, Wyatt and Keith, that have been working for, with us for over 10 years. We now live in Oklahoma. Uh, I've, I've moved all over the world in search of cannabis, um, and I find my home here right now. And I, man, I, I'm from the South, I'm from Georgia, I've lived in Northern California. Come on in, Tommy, you're a little late, but that's okay. <laughs> right. um, but uh, we really do love it here in Oklahoma, and, and uh, I love fishing. We go fishing every day we can, uh, and uh, I, I, uh, I really like the outdoors and just being around cannabis. Uh, um, one of the things I've, I've also really enjoyed in my life is I started a podcast called The Real Dirt Podcast, and this has allowed me to speak to people all over the world that are industry experts and really ask them great questions that, that uh, um, you know, I've, I've been interested in, but uh, it, it's hard to get some industry and experts to really speak to just any random person. So I started a podcast, and we had about 30,000 listeners. If you're interested in anything cannabis, download my podcast. It's the Real Dirt podcast. We're on iTunes, Spotify. Um, come on in, guys. Sorry, I just got started a little early. I know the room was said to go down that way. Um, uh, this, by the way, is a 0.3% hemp plant that you see in the corner here. Uh, this is uh, legal, um, legal cannabis, federally legal cannabis in the U.S. Uh, uh, hemp and ganja, they're both cannabis. Uh, we don't have to differentiate them that way. This, just, this is a 0.3 plant. So cocoa fiber. Uh, this is a pile of cocoa fiber that we've just processed at our plant in um, Denver. And cocoa fiber is an amazing natural resource. It's, it's not mined. Coconuts fall to the ground every day, and it makes it one of the most truly re, uh, renewable resources that we have. Um, yes, we have to ship it across the, the world to process it. Yes, there are some problems with uh, uh, wastewater associated with processing cocoa fiber. Um, most cocoa fiber, most cocoa, it's grown on the coast places, and it's really high in sodium and chloride potassium. So when, when most people process them, they're processing those uh, chemicals out of it. 
Uh, sodium chloride will kill your plants, um, and potassium will too, but at certain levels it's, it's uh, really healthy for your plants. Grow store in Colorado, and all this just saying like, hey man, I kind of know what I'm talking about, because there's a bunch of people in this industry that got no fucking idea what they're doing. <laughs> And I, like I say, I do love it all, and uh, this just kind of shows you the scale of the stuff we do. So uh, I have a USDA-approved composting technique. This is really hard to get. In California, when I got it, there were only five people that had licensed compost operations in California. California is a pretty big state. Most of the compost you are buying isn't compost. It hasn't, doesn't have the right carbon-nitrogen ratio to be called compost. People just call it compost. Uh, this is a really hard thing to get. Why did I get it? Well, the USDA came in one day and shut me down and said, you got to have a composting license. <laughs> so I spent about a year of my time figuring out how to make compost without chemicals. The USDA, the way that they set up composting is they want you to bring the temperature up to a certain temperature within a few days, and then with temperature and moisture, you have to flip it every three days. Well, it's kind of impossible to do it with the way they set it up with uh, uh, organic constituents. They want you to use uh, ammonium nitrate and um, other uh, uh, urea, other things that will really bring the temperature of your uh, 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 organic material up. Um, the reason you're doing this is you want to get all the E. coli and the bad biology out of uh, whatever you're composting. Um, the USDA is really concerned about E. coli in our, in our food system. This is all cannabis. It's all ganja. Every, almost all the potting soil I've ever sown has gone into ganja or hemp. So we don't really worry about E. coli, but the USDA did. Um, the process I developed was basically with just chicken shit and uh, um, chicken shit and lime water, right? But we proved to them that it could be done organically, and uh, I possess one of those only um, uh, approved uh, technologies for doing it. I also have an earthworm casting process that's also approved in a similar manner. Um, I developed all this years ago sheerly because the government forced me to do it, right? I didn't want to do it, but they said, hey, we're going to shut you down unless you don't, right? Uh, and when I investigated all this, it really made me wonder what compost was and what organic products was. Up until this point, I was really hardcore organic. I loved organic fertilizers. I thought there was absolutely nothing wrong with organic. It could save the world, and organics can save the world. Earthworm co castings and compost can help us with all our industrial waste. Uh, but there are some problems with it. Um, I, I, I know I'm a, I'm a little standout-ish here. Son of a butcher, I became vegan at an early age. Uh, and I'm a vegetarian now, and I've really tried to pursue all organic uh, inputs into my body, whether I'm smoking it or eating it, since I was 21. I grew up in a very rural agricultural background, and when I left home and went to college, I saw the stuff everybody was buying as food and that they were serving us. I was like, this isn't real. And it really made me uh, uh, heed the words of my grandmother. You know, we do this all over the country, uh, all over the world. This is a particular, this is in Denver and in Mexico. You can see I, I like having a good time, too. Uh, um, we work with companies all over the world, all over the state. This is in Maryland. Um, uh, this is a uh, really large garden in Denver, Colorado. And all these are just to kind of, like, show you uh, that we've been around a little bit. And I, 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 I believe, at least, in what I'm talking about. This is in Colombia. We've got some projects going on right there. And, you know, the interesting thing about Colombia and South America uh, with cannabis and hemp is they really believe in organics um, and uh, not using uh, chemical pesticides, uh, not using uh, chemical constituents to grow any of their product. Uh, so it's, you know, we, we seem like we're progressive here, but in South America they, they've really taken to this. And part of it is because you don't have to buy it. You can make it yourself. And organics really can be some of the, the cheaper inputs um, that you put into your garden. Uh, this is in Humboldt County. This is one of our gardens up there. It's a 7,600 square foot of a fully automated light depth greenhouses. This is when they were under construction. Um, in Kentucky, this is a hemp field. This is an all organic hemp field. This is grown with the potting soil we make, and they just added 
uh, or organic constituents. This is all hemp for smoking, uh, smoking hemp. Um, it's popular right now in the industry. So what does organic mean? Now this definition really doesn't do anything for us. And we all have our own ideas of what organic is. But running, running uh, Cultivate Oklahoma, uh, Cultivate Colorado, so many people that come in with this idea of what organic is. And the main thing, and I can't really give you a great definition for it. I just put this one up. This is the Webster's Dictionary definition. doesn't really make sense to me. Um, most people have their own personal definitions. Many people just think it's about pesticides. Right, I don't spray pesticides or I only use organic pesticides. And man, that's a great place to start, right? Uh, many people think it's just planting in the ground, right? And that's organic. But uh, the reality of it is, is the, the, the products that you put into the ground, uh, the products you put into your soil, and the products that you put on to the plant uh, are <clears throat> of the earth, so to speak. Uh, this is in Tennessee, this is a hemp field there. Uh, the, the big movement in hemp right now, and one of the great things about it is uh, there's a misnomer that you can't fertilize this or it has to be organic. So right now, lots of the hemp that we're getting in the U.S., it's all organically grown hemp. Lots of uh, misinformation about how hemp grows, that you don't need to fertilize it, that you can grow it on marginal land. This guy didn't grow it on marginal land, and you can see it, it looks pretty good. Uh, this is 20 acres of organic uh, organic hemp. So you can see it can be done. Here's one of my good friends, John Piccarelli. If anybody knows John, you can, you can see how he hounds it up. There, there's a handful of certifications, and these aren't the only ones, but when you're out buying organic products, you, you, these are some sort of stuff to look at. OMRI is a private institution, uh, Organic Materials Research uh, Institute, and, and the interesting thing about OMRI is we see it on a lot of products. Uh, anybody ever seen this term, OMRI? Right? Um, well, they're a private group, and pretty much anybody can pay to get into it. Right? You're paying for the stamp. They're not really checking up on you. They ask you for a, a, a self-reported list. Um, so just because you see OMRI on a product, it does not mean it's organic. You really have to read the label. Uh, USDA organic, this really doesn't concern cannabis so much because uh, cannabis, uh, only hemp is federally legal and ganja isn't. Um, but this is another term we see. And then we have the National Organic Program, uh, NOP, and it's about the constituents that go into the products. Um, so those are just some like certifications and terms uh, that you can look for when you're, buying, when you're buying organic products to be aware of it. Now, these are the renewable organic inputs. And we, some of these can come in bottles. Most of them come in bags. Uh, I, sell, I sell bottled fertilizers of all types. I don't discriminate against it. Uh, but uh, in, in my opinion, especially outdoor greenhouse, large-scale agriculture, you really need to be using a renewable organic imp input. Now, what do I mean by renewable? All of the things on this list were grown or waste products. And uh, uh, that, in my mind, makes them superior organic uh, products. Um, I'll just go down the list here and kind of talk about each one of them. Feather meal, uh, this is a waste product from uh, the chicken industry, the poultry industry. Uh, this is a really great high in nitrogen potassium product. Uh, if, if you eat organic lettuce or organic tomatoes, they're using feather meal and some sort of chicken litter, more than likely. Uh, chicken litter also is a really excellent uh, uh, organic constituent, but litter and composted chicken aren't quite the same. Um, when you take chicken litter and compost it, that is you uh, neutralize the carbon and nitrogen ratio, uh, it then becomes, car it then becomes a, a, a great fertilizer um, with a, just the right nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus for cannabis to grow in. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys use chicken litter. Anybody use chicken litter? Anybody use chicken shit? Yeah, great, great, great products. Um, kelp is my number one favorite renewable resource. Kelp grows in the ocean. It's harvested and gathered. Uh, um, it grows feet a day. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it's an, also an incredible um, organic input. It has many uh, 
uh, hormones, has many, uh, lots of biological activity. It's really inexpensive. It's really cheap. If you're not using kelp, it's a really great product to get. There's all types, however, of kelp. Um, look for the organic kelp. Just because it says kelp does not mean it's organic. The liquid kelp that is that we see, they use a, a, a number of things, uh, potassium hydroxide specifically, in order to extract or concentrate the kelp. Uh, they increase the potassium uh, by adding extra potassium in it. So when you see these kelps that are like 1, 1, 18, um, that's probably not an organic kelp but I'm not a purist any longer. And uh, I think kelp's a great product. And um, you know, that 1118 works incredible. It's definitely uh, has chemical in it, but it's an incredible product. Um, and especially towards the end of flowering, it's great. Um, bone meal and fish bone meal, we'll throw those two right together. They are waste product from the slaughterhouse industry, whether it's uh, the fishes or the cows and the sheeps. Uh, lot, many people have problems with bone meal um, uh, because of uh, it is dangerous to inhale, right? And, and many of these products are dangerous for us to use, and we should all be using gloves. We should all be using masks of some sort. And you might see a picture of me in here. There's not going to be one with me a mask on. Right, <laughs> but we all should probably be wearing it. Uh, fish emulsion and fish uh, hydroslate are my two favorite organic uh, nutrients. Uh, and, and fish emulsion it was explained to me best by someone. It was like, it's like making fish soup. You throw all the rotten fish into a vat, you cook it up to temperature, and we drop the pH, uh, bottle it up. Um, uh, fish emulsion is really high in uh, um, nitrogen, but man, it just has incredible biological life that just cannot be beat. Uh, yes, the dog loves it. Yes, the bears love it. Um, my dog really loves the fish bone meal, but she'll eat the fish emulsion too. Um, the uh, it, fish emulsion always usually comes in a bottle. It's a very inexpensive fertilizer to buy, and if, whether you're foiler spraying or putting it on your plants, um, you know it, it's it's a really great addition to to whatever you're doing. Um, uh, fish hydroslate uh, is. Uh, ground up fish that they then, uh, I'm, and man, I might, there might be someone in here that knows a better way that this is made or, or a better explanation, but it's basically uh, dehydrated fish. Um, they uh, flash, dry it, freeze it. It comes out to a powder instead of a liquid. They evaporate all the liquid through this freezing technique, um, and you have this uh, nice granule, super concentrated powder uh, that again, works great for foiler feed. That works great. Uh, mix it in your soil. It works great as a liquid nutrient. Um, earthworm castings. Earthworms can save the world. Absolutely. Uh, specifically, red worms that are engineered uh, to eat organic material um, populate really fast. They, they Within six weeks, uh, they can achieve a critical mass population to really grow. And they can go. They 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 can eat anything. Uh, these guys can eat nuclear waste. They can eat petroleum products. They can eat diesel. They 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 love it all. Um, and uh, what happens with the earthworm is is most of the earthworm castings come from two different types of source. And you can see it now that you got. Now I'm going to tell you this. You can go look at your earthworm casting source if you're using it. Uh, most earthworms castings come from just paper. They are set next to a recycling plant and all the cardboard and all the paper, they grind it up and uh, they may like feed some corn or some liquid other fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer to it, and then they feed the uh, uh, earthworms the paper. Uh, the earthworms then uh, uh, run the paper through their digestive system and they poop it out on the backside. And the interesting thing about the earthworm castings is it has a casing on the outside of the excrement that allows for time release in our soil, right? This is like nature's number one fertilizer, right? It's not so strong. It's got tons of biological life in it. You can't grow plants exclusively with it, uh, but a really great product.
Now, the best way earthworm castings are made, however, they're the expensive ones you see, right? Because you guys may have all seen this. There's a cheap earthworm castings. Those are made from cardboard, more than likely. Um, or they're cut with compost. Uh, and the, uh, the, the really expensive earthworm castings, they compost manure and, uh, to get the E. coli out, and then they feed the earthworm castings, the earthworms, the manure. Uh, and this is the highest quality product you can get. It's active in biological life the most, has uh, 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 just really the best constituents for the plants to use in it. Um, Soy protein isolate, uh, this sounds like a, a weird one, and this is a fringe product because you can absolutely get this organic and non-organic depending on if the soy, pro, uh, the soy source is uh, organic or GMO. Um, and they basically just process uh, soy protein just like we process uh, isolate for THC and CBD. They isolate the compound through molecular weight. Right, and uh, uh, that's a, 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 a fancy term for saying they basically have this still that pulls out just the nitrogen side of it and makes it a nice concentrated powder. Uh, soy protein isolate is an incredible vegan source for nitrogen. The plants love this stuff. It is hard to find. Um, I, I, we do have it at Cultivate Oklahoma City, though. Uh, I'm, oh, well, I wasn't going to sell anything, that's right. Um, uh, but uh, we really love protein, uh, soy protein isolate. Uh, it comes under a few different names, uh, but, it, but again, just read the, uh, read the ingredients. Um, alfalfa, right? Alfalfa, you know, right now is the time of year. Everybody's planting alfalfa. If you guys are local, you see it out there. People are tilling up the ground right now for it. Um, it has it, fresh alfalfa sprinkled right on top of your soil. Uh, will will kind of start to mold a little bit. And when it does that, it's actually releasing this chemical tricantinol into your soil, into your plants. Uh, it's, a, it's a growth hormone that's unregulated by the government, so it's a hard one to get. But you can just sprinkle alfalfa right on your plants. And uh, plants love it, man. It's also a high nitrogen source. But uh, al alfalfa is an expensive product. Neem meal. Uh, I, Many people in here know neem. Many people here spray neem for pesticides. Uh, great, great uh, uh, pesticide product in, in many ways. Um, uh, neem, however, for pest prevention, prevention, you have to watch it with your extractors. It does uh, stay on the plant for a long time. The extractors don't really like it. It shows up in the extracted product. So if you're using neem oil, spraying neem on your plants in any way, just uh, be sure that, um, or, or just think about the last time you spray it. I don't promote spraying anything in flour if you can get away with it. I know many people do. I'm not judging anybody on that. But uh, 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 neem meal is a waste product from uh, a concentration of, of neem extract. Um, uh, it's a cake. They call it neem cake. It's excellent. It's high in nitrogen. It works great for soil-borne pests, fungus gnats, uh, root aphids. Uh, neem meal is a great, great product. If you're, if you're not using it, you, you should. Um, and crab meal, another one of my favorite uh, fish products. Uh, between crab meal, uh, earthworm castings, uh, bone meal, and feather meal, you really can't build a better soil or a better nutrient constituent to your soil. Uh, how many people build their own soil in here? People build their own soil in here? Um, you know, the, these, these are really great products. They're the most inexpensive products. All the commercial organic products that we see, they, they use feather meal. They use bone meal. Um, they, it's inexpensive. You know, bone meal is like 20 bucks for 50 pounds. Uh, the application rate is 1 to 5 pounds a yard. Uh, it's it's a uh, it's it's a really incredible product, but it, it's it's inexpensive as opposed to soy protein isolate. It's very expensive, um, and that's why many people just uh, uh, foiler spray with that. Um, now I really love compost tea. My grandma taught me how to make compost tea when I was a kid, uh, but uh, uh, she she did an anaerobic compost tea, which uh, she took a five gallon bucket, we threw some manure in it filled it up with water, it sat there for the season, and then she'd take a cup out of it and pour it in her uh, watered can, and that's how I learned to grow radishes and cucumbers and, and spinach and carrots and tomatoes. Uh, 
Uh, but now we've learned a little bit differently that it's better to actively aerate your compost tea. And what that means is, is you add uh, air to uh, your compost tea. Oh, hey, let me step back a little bit. Uh, uh, compost tea is uh, basically uh, making a tea of organic ingredients. There's many, 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 many recipes. I have made thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of compost tea. My previous company, Royal Gold, we add compost tea to all of the soil that we had there. Um, at the time, I really believed that it, it gave us uh, more biological life and an extra edge, and the, the, the growers an extra edge on using it when they, they got their product. And I still believe that. Um, but a, a compost tea is difficult uh, to make over time. Because just like it's easy to brew the beneficial bio biology, it's just as easy to brew the non-beneficial biology. Um, uh, uh, Elaine Ingram, she's really promoted this actively aerated compost tea. Uh, Elaine, I've seen her speak. I've been to her conferences. Uh, uh, it is definitely a Bible to her. She stands on top of it and preaches it. But I see like uh, the problems with compost tea as well as, as the great things uh, that you can use with it. The, you know, a, sample, a simple compost tea rep recipe would be something like... Uh, uh, earthworm castings, bat guano, a little bit of sugar, right? Very, very simple. It doesn't have to be complex. And what happens when you use earthworm castings or compost in compost tea is you increase the biological life, the microbes, by the millions and millions. So you can never put out enough earthworm castings. Well, maybe you could, but you could, you'd, you'd really have to put out a lot of earthworm castings to equal the amount of biological life that you get from making compost tea from a smaller amount of earthworm castings. Uh, it, it's not a cure-all compost tea. Uh, uh, you, you should spray it on your plants. You should feed it to your plants. Uh, however, I have seen more people damage their gardens with compost tea than actually uh, get benefit from it. And I know Elaine's going to would argue with me right now, you know, into the end of days on how it cures powdery mildew and botrytis. And it can do all of that stuff, but uh, uh, I've seen it do the exact opposite. I've seen gardens completely get inundated with botrytis with uh, uh, powdery mildew because the people were spraying compost tea too much. They didn't understand what was going on. They were spraying the bad biology on it. They're not cleaning their equipment. And it actually, like, you know, is a detriment to their garden. Um, I believe with compost tea, and this is all my theory and experience, but you should absolutely make it its most cost-effective fertilizer that you can add. And if you put it in all the transitions directly into your soil, uh, it really does the best benefit. Yeah, you should spray it too, but uh, uh, it does the best when you feed it directly into your soil, uh, especially in your transitions. So uh, the, the best thing to do with compost tea, if you're making, making compost tea in some way, and this is a classic way people make compost tea, you don't need any of this fancy equipment. All you need is a bucket and some source of aeration. Um, but uh, you can see how dirty these things are, right? And that's why I put them up here. And I know everybody's got a dirtier compost tea brewer. I surely do, sitting in the corner. I'm not using it right now. Uh, but uh, this, type of, this type of dirt and contamination is exactly what causes the bad biology uh, in your compost tea. So if your compost tea vessels look like this, you, you need to clean them up a little bit. Um, I'd also suggest you uh, only use soap and water to clean your compost tea vessels. Don't use abrasive cleaners. Don't use uh, uh, abrasive sponges. Um, and that goes with anything plastic that you're reusing in your garden. As soon as you scratch that plastic, it just it, 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 uh, gives a place for the bad biology to grow, right? So if you've got grow trays, or I'll get to you in a second, but uh, I love fish shit, by the way. It's one of my favorite products. Um, you know, uh, uh, we like just water for cleaning stuff and do it over and over and over and over again. Just water, just water. Just spray it down with pressure. Um, and uh, uh, that's how we clean things. Um, the gentleman over here was raising his hand for a question. So, like on those brewers right there, mm -hmm. 
would it be good to use bleach to clean it out? You know, I, I, the, the thing, the, you know, I, I'm not a bleach fan. I would say vinegar or hydrogen peroxide is a better product to use. And uh, many gardeners here already use zero tall in their gardens, which is, you know, 29% hydrogen peroxide. Um, and it's a great cleaning agent. Just wear gloves. Uh, it will damage your skin. Um, the problem with bleach is that it leaves a biofilm on the inside. You guys have all seen it. You clean something with bleach and it's got that slick feel on it. It's just hard to get that to go away, right? And you, you, you end up, when you start using bleach, uh, in my opinion, cause more problems uh, than you're solving by cleaning your product, right? Uh, I don't try, I don't, I, we try not to use harsh chemicals. I know sometimes you have to clean stuff and it's just how it is, but... If you have plastics, whether it's propagation trays, grow trays, buckets, uh, the, 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 the best thing you can do is not clean them with abrasive cleaners or abrasive uh, a, a sponge or anything like that. All right, now here's the ugly truth. I talked about my title. It's a little misleading because nothing's been really ugly so far. But, God, man, every single one on these things are strip mined. Right, and bat guano, man, I love bat guano, right? How many people like bat guano here? I love bat guano, man. It works great, high nitrogen to the plants, high phosphorus to the plants, but the way we get bat guano is it's strip mine. They go to bat, they, they, right now, a major source is Mexico. Somebody sees bats growing, uh, uh, flying out of a hole in the ground. That's an underground cave. They come in with excavators. They dig it up. The top part of uh, uh, the cave is the newest bat guano, and that's filled with a high nitrogen bat guano. And they harvest all that, and that's this nice, fluffy stuff. Meanwhile, all the workers, they just got T-shirts tied around their shirts. They're breathing this stuff in. They're getting lesions on their lungs. They're literally dying from this. Uh, and uh, seabird guano as well. Uh, this really this kills the bat habitat. This kills the seabird guano habitat. Um, as soon as they get the fresh guano, as soon as that's all harvested, the hard stuff at the bottom of the cave, the stuff that's been there for hundreds or thousands of years, that's all high potassium and phosphorus bat guanos and seabird guanos. So when you see those two products on the shelf, that's what you're looking at. And yes, it does have to do with how the bat's fed or where it comes from, but most of the stuff we get right now is coming from Mexico. Uh, seabird guano is really hard to find. In the South Pacific, wars were fought over seabird guano because they would take all of the high nitrogen stuff um, and get down to the high potassium and phosphorus stuff to make munitions. And that's how many munitions were made for years. And if there's any firearm enthusiasts here and you shoot old ammunition from the 40s and 50s, you can, you can smell that little bit of smell that reminds you of seabird guano, right? Um, and people still use it today for it, but uh, we're really literally destroying bat habitat and seabird habitat when we're strip mining these products. Uh, gypsum, man, it's hard to grow cannabis without gypsum. Uh, I mean, I know we just put a, a ton on our acre that we got growing right uh, north of town here, and gypsum really works great to loosen up the soil. But again, it is a mined product, and we, we really should be conscious of uh, where these products come from. Uh, rock phosphate and trace minerals, glacial rock dust, all really great components, and we see those in all types of uh, organic soils and living soils, and they really do uh, add, add great uh, micronutrients uh, to the soil. The plants really do love this. Uh, man, it's hard to go wrong with glacial rock dust when you're growing uh, uh, trees, non-ganja trees. Uh, but, they, but, but they really do like it. And same thing with azomite and green sand. Man, azomite's a really great product, high in silica. I don't know if you, any of you guys are using azomite, but it's, it's a great, great product. Helps your plants with uh, heat and water stress, which I can contest to up in Wellston. It's pretty damn hot, and uh, you need something to help you out up there. Um, and green sand, too. Uh, these things are all mined, Right? And uh, it's something that we really have to think about is where this stuff comes from. Because we want, um, you know, the th main thing people say to me when they come and talk about organics or living soil is they want the best quality product. They want to, to protect the earth. They want to have this, this, this feeling that they're doing something good for the world. Man, 
all these products are pretty much bad for the world. Uh, I, I know lime is, in, I mean, you have to use lime in order to adjust the pH of peat. You know, gypsum is the best source of calcium, really. Uh, but uh, all the stuff strip mined, right? And it's just something we should think about. I'm not saying don't use it. I still use bat guano. I love it. I still use gypsum. I still use lime. Um, but I do think about it, and uh, I really try not to go overboard with all of this. Uh, you know, one thing I see people doing when they make soil is they're putting far too much of all of these constituents in there. I'm going to give you guys a, tell you guys how you should make soil is um, basically any of the organic ingredients that I've listed or, or I've listed or talk about here, all this dry stuff, all the mine stuff, uh, it's one pound to five pounds per yard when you're putting it in your soil, right? Uh, most of the ingredients, if you get over about 15 total pounds per yard, you, you're not going to use it right now. Right, you're you're literally better off like waiting. So we used to put 50 pounds of bat guano in a yard. Man, well, man, you only need two or three, right? Uh, we used to put you know uh, eight pounds of azomite in a yard. You really only need one, right? Uh, but it's really easy. But uh, uh, just look at the back of the container, the back of the bag. Do some Google research and like how many pounds per yard. How many pounds per square foot? Here's another something that confuses people is uh, 100 square feet, because that's how a lot of this stuff is listed on the packaging, um, is, is also a yard. That's what we usually consider a yard in the industry. I know it might not make sense. It might not make out right. But like, that's how we formulate this stuff. And, and, and again, man, I've, I've, made, I've made tons and tons of potting soil. I'll, I've made some bad potting soil, too. Right, I've made potting soil that's killed my plants. I've made potting soil that's killed other plants, other people's plants, uh, and I've really tried to learn, uh, you know, about like the best way to do it. Uh, but it's also your pocketbook, right? If if uh, many people they come in, they buy a, ba a bale of Promix, they add eight pounds more lime because they think they need the lime and the eight pounds a yard. But man, you really don't. You only need about a half a cup if you want to add some extra lime into a, a, a yard of Promix, uh, which is three bales. When I, when I discovered this, another soil maker uh, kind of introduced me to it. Um, uh, this guy was making a product up in Humboldt called Power Flower. He, he really got me into making soil. Uh, I've always enjoyed making my own soil. And I was buying all of this stuff. And he was like, yeah, man, tr trace minerals, that's, you know, strip mined out of Nevada, glacial rock dust that's strip mined out of Montana. and it just makes you feel bad, man, you know, or it makes me feel bad. Some people don't care, and I get it. So is there any place that we could get this stuff that's more sustainably, you know, gathered, or are we just kind of, you know, shit out of luck? <laughs> man, you know, I, I'm not saying you're shit out of luck, but the thing that's not on here is peat moss, and, you know, they... Uh, I buy tons of peat moss. Uh, we put it in our potting soil, growers' potting soil. Uh, um, and the manufacturers, they say that it is sustainably harvested because they rotate their, their fields that they harvested from, right? When you look at it, it still looks like a strip mine, right? Uh, but it's, it's, it's something you got to have, right? Now, uh, the... The let's see, let's take it back here to the renewables. The thing that's not on here is coconut fiber, and we did talk about that earlier. Uh, coconut fiber is a good substitute for peat, but not a complete replacement. Some people hate cocoa fiber because of the way it retains moisture and holds water. Some people love it because of the way it holds more water. And, you know, like it, it, it's there, there's so much stuff about it. But cocoa fiber really is one of the best products that you can use that falls to the ground every single day. Coconuts fall all the ground every here you know I skipped this whole thing let me tell you this so uh, long fibers in the coconut you guys all seen those long fibers in the coconut when you buy it they in Asia they weave those into textiles it's where you know rugs and all kinds of stuff they they uh, uh, also put it in pharmaceuticals as a, a filling agent and the short fibers the inner fiber that falls to the ground that's waste product and that's what we use to grow in 
right? So that waste product in the past has been dumped out of the sea or burned. Uh, there, there's many bad, lots of bad information about cocoa and cocoa fiber, but it's basically left in a big pile and process and processed for a while in a big pile, uh, which means it just gets rained on, or there's some dude in flip flops watering it like this. I'm serious. I'm serious. It's a really homespun industry in India. We get all the cocoa fiber from India. It's all done by hand. There's literally. You know, uh, a guy gets hired, he brings his wife and seven kids, they all show up to work. He gambles over in the corner with his other buddies that did the same thing. They, they all have a 50-liter bag or a 50-liter basket. They pick up the basket full of coconut. They dump it into a, a hand-pressed hydraulic machine, stamp it, boom, out comes a brick of cocoa fiber. And uh, if any of you have gotten cocoa fiber and bricks, you'll realize how different each one is and that's because it's all literally handmade um and uh you know i'm i'm uh, not against any of that these guys are only getting paid 50 cents a day that shit's bad too uh and it's actually the the husband that brought his family he's getting paid 50 cents and those other the, the family they're not getting paid but the whole family gets paid i guess and uh, uh, so there is, you know, we're all, we all wear tennis shoes that we know is not made, you know, in the best conditions. And also this great renewable product is maybe not made in the best conditions for, pe for people. Uh, I have personally suffered severe uh, infections, sinus infections from breathing in cocoa fiber. Uh, it's a fine dust when you're making it, and uh, it, it's, it's absolutely dangerous to you. Um, and so you should wear a mask. And when we make this product commercially, we all wear masks. We all wear glasses. Uh, you know, we've sent so many people to the hospital with a cocoa fiber in their eye. We've had so many people have to lay out for two weeks because they breathed in cocoa fiber. But, uh, man, great renewable resource. Uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's also uh, poor for you. Um, here's a... Uh, we got any questions? Any questions? You said something about the soil. You said three bales equals three bales of pro mix equal a yard. Pro mix, okay. Right? Yeah, and, and uh, I know it's confusing because it says three cube, three point eight cubic feet on the outside, but that's compressed, and you know you bust it open and it's about seven or eight. Yes, sir. So far, no mention of perlite or vermiculite. Yeah, you know, uh, perlite and vermiculite are are. Some states don't regulate those as organic uh, uh, materials. Uh, uh, perlite and vermiculite are also both mine substances, right? I didn't list them because they were, they're more soil constituents instead of fertilizers. Uh, and I also didn't really talk about all the cool biological stuff in this, in this thing today, too. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, ganja farmers love perlite. Right, people who make soil love perlite. The great thing about perlite is when you're making soil, you mix some perlite in there, you can start to see when the perlite is evenly distributed through your soil. Oh, everything else is evenly distributed too. Right? Uh, uh, outside, you know, there's not as much need for perlite as indoor gardens. Right? Um, the, the reason that uh, uh, cannabis users use so much perlite uh, is because, you know, it dries out faster. And you can get employees to water it on a regular schedule. And uh, uh, cannabis farmers also feel like they have to feed their plants as much as possible, right? Which cannabis will take on tons of nutrients. Um, and I'm not opposed to perlite in any manner. Uh, it is safer to use than vermiculite, though. Uh, uh, rice hulls. You know, the thing about rice hulls is it's really good in uh, cells. So for, for small, like, six packs. But it... it, it uh, it composts almost immediately and it collapses with pressure. So we've done, you know, because I've made thousands of yards of soil, we test everything. I'm, I'm, I'm interested about stuff, so I test stuff. And uh, in just a short period of time, a few weeks, your aeration benefits are gone with rice hulls. Right now, in small little things that it's, there's not a lot of pressure or water on, rice hulls work great. Right, especially in areas like South Carolina, Louisiana, California, where there's so much waste product with rice hulls. Right. It, other it, beneficials? Um, and, well, the uh, the the other beneficials in the that are associated with the rice hulls. Use the rice hulls instead. 
Um, is, is there something else used instead of the rice hulls? No, no, no. I'm saying is there other beneficials of using the rice hulls? Maybe like as a cover, like over the top? Yeah, mulch. You know, it works for great for mulch, right? Um, it's going to compost in. Yeah, and you'll, you'll see it when you make soil with it, and now that I say it, you're going to recognize it, how much your material shrinks when you use the rice hulls. Right, you know, you'll mix up a 20 gallon container and by the end of the season it's shrunk, you know, four or five inches. Right, and that's, that's the rice hulls. Uh, uh, lava rock, right, also like a mined mineral, um, but uh, it, it's, it's a, maybe a better substitute, right? Um, and the thing about, interesting thing about rock, lava rock is uh, it's often like next to a gravel pot pit or something. So it's usually not the main thing they're doing. They're like, yeah, let's get through all that lava rock and then we'll get to the stuff we're using, right? And for agricultural purposes, it's all the smaller waste product that they can't use it for, uh, for, for, gra for gravel purposes, right? In, in uh, uh, Northern California, tons of old uh, lava fields, lava mines, um, and so they use it as a gravel, right, a pea gravel. Um, but the smallest stuff is actually kind of a waste product in that whole industry. Uh, this is a garden in Columbia uh, that we're working on right now. Uh, this is, uh, man, they, they just, everything's passive. There's, there's, there's next to no power in here. You can see that they had some uh, light bulbs hanging from this to keep these plants for vegging for a little while. They're right on the equator there. So... As soon as you put plants out, they start to flower. Uh, but all of this soil was just dug up outside, you know, the, on the farm right next door to the greenhouses, and they just put it in pots and, and grew with it. And these guys, they, uh, they feed it uh, uh, fish product, and that's it. They only give it nitrogen, um, uh, which is a common thing farmers do is just give it nitrogen. And then they believe there's enough potassium and phosphorus in that. Uh, Columbia's been growing weed for years, so I hear. And uh, they, I think they got some pretty decent soil down there. Uh, anybody growing outside in the soil here? Right? Yeah, I, I am too. Uh, soil grower for sure. Uh, it's really important to test your soil if you haven't tested it, especially on previous agricultural ground. Um, all kinds of chemicals have been used on agriculture for the past 100 years, and some of that stuff we put on the ground in the 50s didn't work so right. Uh, but uh, it's a simple test. Uh, you know, you can send it off to your county extension. You can send it off to your local university, um, and they'll have an agricultural test for soil. And that really means the soil in the ground and not the potting soil that you make. Uh, but you can learn a ton from it. And uh, they'll tell you exactly what to put in your soil. Uh, we've done this for, for many, many, many people. It's interesting. Most people just need to add organic material and nitrogen, and there's enough potassium and phosphorus for cannabis to grow sufficiently. Um, but uh, I'll tell you this. You know, you sprink, sprinkle some extra potassium and phosphorus, and uh, they get the, the buds get bigger for sure. I talked about two earlier. I started to ask a question. But we always – all we would use – and our tea was cow manure. Yeah. And we'd, we'd stir it up. And well, you know that. Today, if we could think of, we wouldn't even bubble it. And we did that once yeah. a week on the, yeah. on the school. And That's how I learned. That's exactly how my grandma taught me is uh, cow manure. The problem with cow manure is it hasn't been composted, right? And so it harbors all the E. coli and the bad bi biology. Uh, um, the good thing about ca no, you know, you really, in, in order for it to compost, you have to have a nitrogen and a carbon source, right? And you put the nitrogen and carbon source like sawdust. Uh, you mix sawdust with a manure, like chicken manure, right? And the uh, nitrogen and carbon ratio is balanced. And what that means is that the nitrogen heats up. Uh, the organic matter, the sawdust, brings it up to temperature, and that nitrogen's getting peeled off, right? But it's also like uh, it, it's also balance, balancing the carbon ratio because if you just plant right in the sawdust, that's going to suck all of the nitrogen out of your plants when you go to to grow plants in it, right? And sawdust is a common thing that nurseries use. They just plant right in sawdust or right in bark. And you can absolutely do that, and you just have to be aware to, to add nitrogen. Now, the great thing about just straight cow manure is the urea, 
right? It's, you know, the runoff from it. And, and, you, and, and uh, if you just run water through, you know, aged manure, you've got a pretty good nitrogen source right there. Uh, but it, it will have bad biology in it. Um, and I'm glad you asked that question because that brought us right to my compost. It's not what you think it is. Most of the compost you buy or think you buy is doing absolutely nothing for your plants other than putting uh, 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 some volume in your potting soil, right? Um, if you go to the Rite Aid or if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you're buying steer manure or cow manure, it's uncomposted, right? And it actually doesn't give you so much benefit to your plants. Like it's cheap. It's $1.39 a bag. I'm not saying don't use it, but you got to be aware it's actually not compost, Right, and and most of the compost that we have has no fertilizer charge in it. Or maybe there's a little nitrogen and a little a little iron. Mushroom compost also. Uh, I, I got I learned lots of my chops working on a research mushroom farm when I was in college, University of Georgia. Uh, and what happens with mushrooms is they're grown in uh, some sort of medium. Uh, they they go through their life cycle, they're harvested, and then the mushroom farmer takes all that and piles it to pile out back. Well, it gets big enough, and he's like, man, i got to get rid of this shit. What do I do? Oh, mushroom compost on Craigslist, <laughs> right? And it's not really mushroom compost, right? It has not been composted. All it more than likely is is grain and peat that have been eaten by mushrooms of all sorts, whatever they're growing. Um, but it's not really a compost, and it absolutely has some beneficials to it. It makes great uh, compost tea. Yeah, bone meal and Man, some of it does, and some of it doesn't. You know, the 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 company I was working for, it was all literally just uh, uh, barley, rye, peat moss sterilized. Depends on what type. Depend on what type. Depend on the farmer. Depend on what they're doing. And then other mushrooms, they grow in a you know in manure, uh, and you know that might be a little bit of better product. Uh, but uh, again, mushroom compost, uh, it does have the tendency to suck up the nitrogen that you put into your plants. Uh, uh, mushroom compost is actually one of the worst composts. Um, when it's bad, which it mostly is, uh, your plants often turn yellow uh, because the, the, the material in it just is fighting for that nitrogen you're putting in there. It wants to balance itself out to a neutral carbon and nitrogen ratio. Wood products, sawdust and bark, are what most of the compost that's uh, filler compost made, right? Um, uh, uh, my former company, Royal Gold, uh, made tons of uh, composted sawdust. We termed, uh, we use this term, uh, uh, forest humus. Right, and we use this term to try to skirt the regulations because I didn't have a composting license. And uh, my uh, my godfather in the potting soil industry, uh, Fox Farm. I don't know if any of you guys use Fox Farm. I learned all my chops from sneaking on their plant and seeing what they were doing. Right, they taught me about how to use sawdust and how to use a, a wood chip uh, as a filler um, in your growing medium. Uh, and it, it can work great, it does work great, but only when it's really made right, right? Royal Gold makes it right most of the time. Fox Farm makes it right most of the time. And I say that because it's compost, and it's hard to make on a commercial level right all the time. But ultimately, it's just filler. So when you're putting compost on your plants, you only have a little bit of nitrogen there. you got some micronutrients for sure. Often, if it's black... When you see compost, you see some brown stuff or some black stuff, what do you think most people choose? The black stuff, right? Hell yeah, black's great. They make it black, they put iron sulfate in it to change the color because they know you want it black, <laughs> right? And so like the best compost is actually brown and doesn't have iron sulfate in it. Now, iron sulfate in many communities is still considered an organic input, right? It's phasing out in California. Uh, but uh, uh, iron sulfate will also keep your plants nice and green, right? And uh, uh, that with a little nitrogen will, will, will make the plants grow or appear that they're growing excellent. And you're like, oh, my plants grow great. They're green the whole time. Nothing's wrong with it, but the, but the yield's going to be off, right? And the, the flavor's going to be off because you didn't really feed it anything other than nitrogen, the micronutrients, and the iron. And I, I love compost. Compost can save the world, man. Too much of our, our waste materials 
uh, are, uh, are wasted, right? Let's back to some Switzerland photos. Uh, another organic garden here. Uh, organic garden in Humboldt County. Now, now you can see, sir, the perlite in all these containers here, right? Popular thing people use. Uh, these are all seven-gallon pots. Uh, this is a longtime customer of ours. Uh, we converted him from using some bad lights to these uh, double-ended uh, uh, phantom lights right here. It really increased his yield. He sent me this first photo. I was like, wow, this is great. You know, uh, uh, I'm growing organically. Look, here's my organic garden. And, and he really believes that, and he only uses organic pesticides. But when you talk to him, he's not really growing organically, right? He's using a pure blend uh, uh, nut nutrient, which is a great product, but it's just organically based, right? He's using a non-organic soil. Um, he is, however, using uh, uh, some organic inputs. And it, this guy's weed tastes great, and he grows great weed. And, you know, uh, I would never argue with him that it's not organic because I'm not going to win that competition there, right? But uh, you read the bottle, and if you can't pronounce what's on the bottle, it's not organic. That's the best way to say it, right? If you can't pronounce it, if you can't spell it, I know there's some, like my wife over there, she can spell everything. Right. <laughs> uh, um, uh, and this is in Denver, Colorado. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this is because, uh, like I said, I've said this the whole thing, I love organics. It might not be the most uh, sustainable way to grow large amounts of cannabis. Right? It might not be the best way to grow the best cannabis either. Uh, this garden is a non-organic garden. Uh, this is by a guy, uh, you can look him up on Instagram, uh, three a light. And this guy grows three and four pounds a light. This guy grows 10 and 12 pounds in a four by eight area, right? And he is, he is, he is using synthetic fertilizer. It's all high quality pharmaceutical grade fertilizer. Uh, he doesn't have any runoff. Um, or has very little, but man, the amount of productivity is so much in this garden and in synthetic gardens that it's really a question that you should ask yourself is, you know, am I growing for sustainability? Am I growing for quality, right? Am I growing for my pocketbook, which that's totally cool, right? Uh, um, you know, people are scared about talking about making money, but I love making money. And who likes to make money in here? Yeah, I love it, man. It just shouldn't be your sole, your sole goal, right? Um, uh, this guy turns his gardens literally six times a year. Uh, he grows great weed up until the day he harvests it, then he ruins it. And me and him have this conversation all the time, I, how, he's, how he's screwing his product up by not harvesting it and, and uh, uh, curing it properly. Um, but it might not be the best weed. Because even if he cured it and grew it properly, it's, it might not be the best weed. And I've, and I've seen it over and over again. The absolute best tasting and flavorful weed is or comes from organic inputs and organic gardens. But you have to be a chef to really do it right with economy, right? Um, if you're in commercial production here and you're using organics and you're not having uh, the, the yield, uh, the health that you would use, um, I know this is sacrilege to many, but man, just a, a, an ETDA micronutrient, which is a synthetic uh, nutrient, will help your plants out greatly at the very beginning. If you put that in at the very beginning and then all organic the rest of the way, man, your plants are going to do far better off, right? And also like a high potassium and phosphorus, like a triple, pho triple phosphate, um, just a little bit, just a little bit, not a lot. Just a little bit, and the plants respond so well, and you get this look and taste that's still organic, uh, but uh, you know it's not truly organic. Most people who say or think they have organic are telling you that they, it's just a sales pitch for some reason. Not truly organic. I encourage all of you, however, to read the label, man. Right? Ask some questions. Google it. There's many snake oil salesmen out here. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I've been going to these things for over 20 years. There are these people out here right now that want to convince you in whatever magic they have that you know they want to extract some resources, some cash, some time from you, and their magic is going to make everything you have so much better. But it's just not really true, man. It's just a 
hard work, right genetics, and uh, looking and talking to your plants. That's really going to be what grows quality, quality product. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I have a question. I have an old school composter. It's metal. Oh, yeah. Okay. Totally. Okay. If I'm a brown compost, is that going to be legal for commercial growing? Yeah. Here in Oklahoma, no problem. And in most places, there's no regulations over that. Maryland and North Dakota have some bad regulations right now over compost. But you'll make great compost in that machine. Uh, water hose. Yeah, just the water hose. And, you know, compost is a little different from compost tea, right, uh, uh, because of the, the, the water and the aeration, right? Thank you. Yeah. Earlier you said vermiculite is more dangerous than perlite. Because when you breathe it in, you breathe it in. It's fine particle. It's really dusty, right? It's dry. Uh, it is... Uh, the there's several. Tom, Tommy, he's an authority on this here. Tommy from Hydro Farm. There's several states that we can uh, sell vermiculite in, correct? I don't know, actually. Okay. Well, yeah. uh, there's several states you can't actually sell vermiculite in. Uh, many people do, but yeah, they, they, they don't like vermiculite. All right. Well, this is usually the point in my talk where I say, fire it up, come smoke me out, or have a good time the rest of the day, and, and thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Man, that was a great episode. So, uh, yeah, man, thanks for joining me. I, I, I'm, I always uh, am grateful that you spend your time listening.